So have you ever had one of those times where you know you got a lot to go through and you never know if you're going to make it to the other side? This weekend is my weekend for that experience. It started out with a double funeral on Friday morning for a couple that were at my Westville church when I was there. The husband passed away in 2022, and he was cremated, and his wife had just passed um, this past March. So his fa their family decided that they wanted to have a double service for them. So their service was held Friday morning at the cemetery. And then my son and his fiance, now his wife, they, we had their wedding rehearsal Friday evening. And to make matters worse, we, well, it wasn't a bad thing, but. <laughs> <laughs> what happened was bad. Um, we had our rehearsal, ran through it twice. And then um, as I was yelling to Dee from up here, she was back there. I said, do you want to go through the rehearsal anymore? And she said, no, we're good. And right then, all the lights went out. We lost electricity, and we decorated the fellowship hall in the dark and ate our dinner in the dark. <laughs> and so then, I, then we had the wedding on Saturday, which I was able to, I got the honor of officiating, so that was um, wonderful. And then today, I have the sermon. So if you're looking for me after service or tomorrow, good luck. <laughs> I'm going to be home sleeping. But in all seriousness, it was an honor on Friday morning to, um, to commemorate the couple that um, was laid to rest. And it was a privilege to be able to um, preside at my son's um, wedding. And I didn't really cry. I know you're shocked. But I didn't really cry at the wedding. And I'll probably cry this morning because I'm just like super tired. <laughs> And then today to be here in front of you is awesome as well, to be able to deliver the message. And I can tell you, I'm still in awe today that God uses me, that God uses me in the capacity that he does, because if you had met me like 20 years ago, you would say this would never be possible. This weekend is a weekend that I'm going to fondly remember for the rest of my life just because of all the events that took place. So it was a privilege. I'm not complaining, so don't take it that way. But I will remember this weekend fondly. And today we are remembering, and the title of the sermon is Remembering Well. In the, there's a little town in um, Victory Mills, New York, and there's a memorial that's called Saratoga Monument, and it celebrates the win of the Americans over the British in 1777 in the Battle of Saratoga during the American Revolutionary War. Now, it has a monument that is huge in stature. It's an imposing 155 feet tall. And they started work on this monument about 100 years after the battle, and there's a staircase that's inside this monument that has like 190 steps to it. And when you get to the top, they have this grand view of the surrounding area. Well, there was a man named Stan Purdom, and he lived in Saratoga Springs in his teenage years, or growing up, and then in his teenage years, his parents moved away. Well, he remembers climbing the staircase with his friends. They would ride their bike to this monument, and this is where they would hang out, and they had fun together. So many years later, he's got a family and his wife and two kids, and they're, they're traveling along in an RV, and he decides to take a side trip. He wants to show his family this monument. So they take a side trip, and they, they get there, and they have no air conditioning in their RV. It's hot and muggy, and the kids are sitting there playing cards at the table. And so he's telling them, come outside, come see this monument that I would like to share with you, the wonderful times that I had there. And they looked out the window and just said, mm, that's okay, it's just another thing. And his wife, he's like, will you come with me? And she said, well, no. She goes, I'm going to stay in the RV with the kids and um, make sure they're okay. And she was thinking more about where they were going to end up staying that night, and she wasn't really interested in seeing this grand monument. So 
he was a little deflated and he decided, well, I'm gonna go see it, I want to remember. So he goes and he gets to the gate and finds that the gate is closed. The gate had just closed a couple minutes before they got there. Nez Purdom was thinking about, he was standing there contemplating everything and the memories he had. He started thinking how no one in his family had looked at the monument for what it really was intended to memorialize. To his kids, it was just another pile of stones. To his wife, it was an inter interruption to their vacation. And to Purdom himself, the monument stood not for the brave soldiers who died in 1777, but as a touchstone of happy times he had there as a child. And if those who had built the monument could have asked Purdom and his family what the monument meant to them, they would have been deeply disappointed in the answers. But that's what happens over time to monuments over the passage of time. They become detached from the events that led to their creation. In fact, if you consider Memorial Day itself, it's a day to remember fallen soldiers who died serving our country. Yet for many, it's simply a day off work or a three-day weekend. And each year, the multitudes of people that gather in cemeteries seems to be less and less. So I want to take a look at um, another script, the scripture reading, Joshua, once again, and recall these words again. This is four through seven. Then Joshua summoned the 12 men from the Israelites who he had appointed, one of them from each tribe. Joshua said to them, pass on before the ark of your Lord, your God, into the middle of the Jordan. And each of you take up a stone on his shoulder, one for each of the tribes of the Israelites, so that they may be a sign among you. And when your children ask in time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the Israelites a memorial forever. Now the people of Israel, they were on the final leg of their journey to the promised land after fleeing slavery in Egypt. And one final barrier was before them. It was the Jordan River. And so God instructed Joshua to send the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant into the river. And as soon as their feet touched the water, the river parted. And it remained parted while the entire horde of um, Israel crossed on the dry riverbed. This was an event that was worth memorializing. That's why God told Joshua to have one man from each of the 12 tribes to take a stone to the riverbed carry it on the riverbank on the site of the newly entered territory. And that's where they piled these 12 stones as a memorial, a monument, to commemorate God's intervention, the parting of the river. Now notice Joshua's closing words. So these stones shall be in, to the Israelites a memorial forever. A memorial forever. And there's a problem with that statement. Predict predictably, subsequent generations of Israelites did not always care about the things that their ancestors' monuments symbolized. Like with Stan Purdom and his family, nobody was asking, what do these stones mean? And regrettably, the same trend continues today regarding our memorials as new generations come along. Since they were not part of the events and factors that were important to their parents' and grandparents' generations, it is common for the younger generations not to assign those things the same value. Our daughter, um, Melanie, she participated in Winter Guard for like five years from eighth grade to um, her senior year in high school. And she had many competitions on weekends and we would travel you know, many different places to different high schools and watch these competitions. Well, there was one school that paid tribute to 9-11. And they had no warning, nothing, as we all sat. And as they were performing, they held up pictures of those who had lost their lives. And as the music was playing and as they were um, doing their part, 
the music would cut in and out, and they would have actual recordings from that day, that day on 9-11. And I got to tell you, the whole, everybody who was watching this performance, there was not a dry eye in the whole place. I couldn't tell you what their performance looked like because I was doing that ugly cry, the kind that you can't stop. Yeah, I know. And we sat there, and as we sat there and heard this music play and saw the pictures and heard the recordings, everything came back all at once. It was like 9-11 had happened just the day before. Everything, the memories of that day, the memories of the community coming together at night in churches and parks and wherever to come together, all of that came flooding back. But not only that, but the thing that hit me the most was that all the youth that were performing, none of them had been alive at that time. If they were, they were little babies, and so it didn't have the same meaning to them. They were merely performing to get um, their awards. For the rest of us, it was heart-wrenching for those of us who lived through that day. Because we remember as those who lived it, and we will never forget, because there is still a place in our hearts that ache from that tragic day. You know, we talk about future generations not knowing the real meaning behind memories or these memorials, but it's not just the problem of future generations, it's, it was also a problem for Israel. Despite the various monuments, the people the one generation erected, the next generation invariably was less interested in what those stones signified. For some, they became mere piles of rocks. And Joshua may have hoped that subsequent generations would ask, what do these stones mean? But in fact, many of the newcomers didn't bother. And one of God's chief charges against the people of Israel is, they have forgotten me. Before we grumble, though, about this failure to remember, let's acknowledge that it's probably not even reasonable for, for us to expect, something, for, to expect something that commemorates a value or event from one generation to have the same meaning for later, later generations who weren't even born when the event being more memorialized happened. And I admit, I'm guilty of this. When I was a kid, I didn't appreciate what my grandpa and my, great, grand, and my great uncles experienced in their lifetime, especially as they served in the Navy during World War II. To help commemorate their memories, we gathered every year on Memorial Day. We would go to the cemetery, and there would be a, cemetery, a ceremony that would take place that they would participate in. And I was just a kid. I didn't understand their memories, I, what they had been through, their dedication to our country and their devotion and their time. I took it all for, for granted. But now those memories of the ceremonies are etched in my heart. They mean so much to me now. But it's the ceremonies that I remember, not what they signified. And if we ignore history, we lose the benefits of learning from the past. We benefit from knowing what we as a people of this earth have gone through and where as a people of faith have been. As someone has once said, without knowing history, we are doomed to repeat it, repeat the mistakes of the past. So here's a key insight. The meaning of past events can't be quite the same for us as for those who lived through them. So our job is not to force future generations to feel the same about our memorials, but we can help them understand why they mean so much to us. We can help them see our piles of stones, both literal and figurative ones, as if not memorials, at least as milestones on the journey of humankind. In other words, every time that we build a, mon a memorial intentionally or otherwise, we can think of what it will mean, both for, future, for the current generation and for future generations. They will be different things. They will have different meanings but secondary meanings can be valid as well. Here, for example, are some, uh, some of the things that a memorial can do. First, for the, um, 
for the generation that was there and then for the next one to come. A memorial can celebrate heroic or happy events or it can mourn tragic ones. Israel's 12 stones testified to the current generation that God helped and guided them. But as a milestone to the next generation, it witnesses to those people that those, that those people were helped by God. And it gives those who weren't there, it lets them know that God is for them there, for them as well, that God will help them. A memorial can remind those who lived through the event it can remind them of the terrible cost of war. As a, as a milestone, it can cause subsequent generations to do all that is possible to avoid bloodshed. A memorial can promote healing for the people who were there or who had loved ones there. Think, for example, about the Vietnam Veterans Memorial or any other memorial. As milestones, they teach, pe teach that people can deal with emotional pain and continue to live. And a memorial can help the immediate gener generation realize that something significant happened that called for courage and sacrifice. So as a milestone, it can communicate to each age that... Can, good gravy... As a milestone, it can communicate that each age has significant things that call for courage and sacrifice. Monument builders don't have the power to force others to honor their monuments, but they can do their best to help them understand the milestone implications. On a personal level, we would like for our children and our grandchildren and future generations to understand what is important and valuable to us. And we hope that some of the things, including our faith in God, will become even greater value to them. But we don't want them bound or limited by our understanding and by our conclusions. We want what we have valued to inform them so that they can go further, climb higher, and reach better. So if we are in the monument building generations, we ought to be less concerned that our monuments speak to the younger generation than that they understand what these mean to us. In time, they will build their own monuments. But if we have been faithful in living up to our best men, to the best, our good gravy, we are almost there. <laughs> but if we have been faithful in living up to the best our monuments represent, ours may serve as building blocks for their monuments. And if you are in the generations coming up, please don't be quick to dismiss what may seem to be stuck in the mud ways of doing what do things from the generations before because there is value behind those things that in time, you're going to want to know about. If I could go back and ask my grandpa and my uncles what they went through, I would love to do that. That is one of the things that I regret. But there is value behind those things that in time, you're going to want to know. So please don't wait until it's too late. Talk to one another and share your stories with one another. And speaking about sharing, I want to share with you the best part of being a pastor for me is the one-on-one -on -one conversations that I have with you. I get to learn about your lives. I get to hear about what you've been through, what you're going through, what you've experienced through your life, what is going on now, and so on. I get to hear your stories, and no two stories are the same. No story is boring for me. They are all interesting and they are all worth listening to. This is what truly brings me joy as a pastor. But I got to tell you that you don't have to be a pastor to share those one-on-one -on -one conversations with one another. That is why we're the church. You know, we can come to each other and we can tell our story, share our faith with one another. So I encourage you, if you don't know someone in this church, Go up to them. They might think you're odd. I don't know. But I'm like giving you permission. Go up to them. Tell me your story. Tell me about your faith. Tell me your background. Because each one of you has a story. Each one of you is worth listening to. And that is my favorite part of being a pastor. 
So I want to, please do that. So in conclusion, I want to say that we are very blessed to live in this country. Our ancestors from past generations, they made the trek here, and we owe them our gratitude. We owe our gratitude to those who have fought for and who fight for our freedom. And we owe them for the sacrifices that have been made on our behalf. And we also owe our gratitude to those who are in the civil service as well, firefighters, EMTs, and um, police officers, and so many others who step up behind the scenes to help keep us safe. But most of all, our gratitude is, should be to Jesus Christ, who set us free from the power of sin and death, and who laid his life down for us so that we may have life and have it abundantly. And not only that, he gave his life and he's taught us how to live our lives. Our freedom is not free. A price has been paid, blood has been shed. So let us be grateful for every day. And may we remember well, to God be the glory, let us pray. God of all creation, we thank you for the bravery of the men and women who have sacrificed everything for our country, along with their families, as we remember them this weekend. But help us to remember them not just this weekend, but always. And may we not take for granted the price that has been paid for our freedom, for our lives. And may we live each day with gratitude in our hearts for all that we do have. And may we share our stories with each other, May we be living examples of what it means to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And it is in Jesus Christ's name that we pray. Amen.